Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Acts, the 19th chapter. <clears throat> this is my hope that we have a tremendous amount of people watching us online this morning. Well, our, our footprint's going out. I know that I get messages all the time, but, you know, I know it's summer, so people are traveling and doing stuff. I've already been communicated about that, but I hope that people watch this and share this message today. And if it doesn't turn out right, maybe we'll do it again the second service, and it will. But in Acts chapter 19, we find a man by the name of Saul. Now, there's an Old Testament Saul who was a king. The New Testament Saul is a Pharisee. A Pharisee is a religious leader. As a religious leader, he was going about persecuting the church. And one of the things that we don't have to deal with here in America, really almost at all, is persecution. Well, I mean, we don't have nobody chasing after us or trying to take us out for being believers in Christ. But here's this man. He carried a note with him, and he had permission from the magistrates to kill Christians. So he would go around and try to find anybody that believed in Jesus, and he'd kill them. And a matter of fact, the Scripture says that he held the coats of those who stoned the teenager Stephen. Can you imagine being a teenager and having faith in God and standing up for God, and all of a sudden they stone you to death, and you look up into the heavens, and you see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne, and you announce that? And here's this man Saul. He's there, and he's witnessing that. Now, as it moves on, Saul in Acts chapter 9 he gets knocked off his high horse. Now, he's not on a horse. We don't know how. He gets knocked down, and, and the word comes to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he asks the question, who are you talking to? Now he's blind. His eyes have gone blind, and, and the word of the Lord says, it's me, the Lord. And, it, and you've got to get slapped like, like a, a wet sock at that moment to realize that what I've been doing is wrong. So now he realizes that, that, so what I do, so the word of the Lord said, go to Straight Street. Everybody say Straight Street. Oh, so you're going to meet a man there by the name of Ananias, and when you get there, he's going to talk to you and help you out. We always need somebody to help our eyes open. Can I get an amen? Somebody give us a little revelation. So here's this man, Saul. He goes down there, and then, of course, God's going to change his name to Paul. We'll know him as Paul the Apostle. But on his way there, uh, God speaks, an angel tells Ananias what's going to happen, and Ananias gets a revelation. I don't want to see this man. This man's killing Christians. This man is against the church, and you're telling me to welcome him? And he says, well, listen, I've set him up in such a way that he's going to pay attention to you. Matter of fact, humility's come all over this man because he can't see right now. So he gets down there to the street, and when he gets there, his eyes are opened by Ananias, and he stays for a while. And if it, Now, you've got, you, if you don't have an imagination, you're not going to get this message. But you've got to start thinking to yourself, here's a man who was murdering Christians, and now he's blind, and now his eyes are open, and we all understand, I have a, somebody who I love very much, he's got a tattoo on his arm, says, no regret, no regrets. He's changed it since, he's tatted over it. How many know we all go through life with some regrets? And Paul had regrets killing believers. And at this moment, he backs up and he starts learning about this gospel, about the resurrection of Jesus. And now we find him in Acts chapter 9. Are you comfortable? While you're standing, I'm, going to, I'm just going to back up just a little bit. This won't be on the overhead, Cheryl, but Acts chapter 9, verse 19, it says that Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And once he began to preach in the synagogues or the churches that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the very thing that he was against. Now he's preaching for it. He said, all those who heard were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? Isn't this the guy that was causing problems among those who called on his name? And hasn't he come here to take uh, them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful. I want to say this to you. Your life is uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, glory to glory. You grow that way. And he's growing in God. He's becoming more powerful. And he baffled the Jews living in Damascus that proven <clears throat> that Jesus is the Messiah. Then we get to verse 23. And it says, after many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. So now he's been killing Christians. And now the Jews are going to try to kill him. They're going to try to take him out. See, see how this thing flipped so fast? So it flipped on him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. They're observing. They're looking for him. Again, you go to bed at peace. You walk into 
supermarkets in peace. You go to work in peace. You never worry about somebody who's going to knock you off the road because you've got to honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker on your Subaru. You never get, you're never concerned about any of that. And, but here, just to whisper the name Jesus would cause such a persecution upon you. And to say that he was God's son and that he resurrected from the dead would cause such a, an angst against you. And here's Paul. The Bible says they're out to kill him. Day and night they're watching for him at the city gates. But, verse 25, his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. So he's left Damascus, now he's gone to Jerusalem. When he got to Jerusalem, they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. He's a spy. He's going to sneak in here and, and kill us, you know. Uh, in other words, they didn't have email on the Internet. They didn't have no text message. They didn't know, so they got to just be confident that somebody is standing up for this man. Who was that man? Barnabas. Everybody needs a Barnabas in their life. Amen. You need somebody to encourage you, somebody to come along beside you, somebody that believes in you. That was Barnabas. But this Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. I'm telling you, God talked to this man. And how in Damascus he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them, and he moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews. But they tried to kill him. Doggone it. The second time, they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. I mean, it's like saying you were in Dayton, Texas, and somebody's trying to kill you, and you escaped to Crosby, and you got to Crosby, and you're hanging out with the Crosbyites. Amen. And then all of a sudden, other folks found out you love Jesus. They tried to kill you, and they send you over to Channel View. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Father, I thank you for the word of God. Anoint my lips. Give me voice to speak. I thank you for the people that are here and those that are watching. God, in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Paul had grown so powerful and influential that they sought to kill him. But the scripture says his followers took him by night and they lowered him in a basket. Now, I don't know if they used a bed sheet. I don't know what they used. But, but I grabbed my dog's leash this morning because I thought she don't need it. She's a pain. Uh, and they, they, they hooked on to, the, to a basket, and they lowered him. And I, as I'm talking to my pastor this morning, again, my mind goes back. What did he weigh? Did he weigh 150 pounds? They say that he's probably a short guy. 200 pounds. Even if he's, if he's 150 to 200 pounds, it's going to take six or eight guys to lower this man down in a basket. Amen. And how far did they lower him? Did it, was it a two-story building? No, it wasn't one. Is it a two-story? Is it three stories? Is it 30-foot of rope? How far did they lower this man down in order for him to, to escape? And when I'm reading this, I'm thinking to myself, there it was no way in their wildest dreams that they could imagine the impact this man would have on the world in the Christian faith. They don't know anything about All they know is this man has been killing Christians. That's all they know. He killing Christians. And yet he comes to us. His eyes are blind. Now he can see. That's a great song. I, th I think I'll write a song about when my eyes were blind and now I see. Uh, anyway, and, and now he can see. And now at this moment, he's in a bat. They, they got to figure out how to get it. Nobody's after any of these other disciples. But this guy has an anointing on his life. He has an ability to reach people. He's a, not a, the scripture said he's a Pharisee. He said he was a Benjamite. He, everything about Paul tells me he knew the first five books of the Bible front and back. So he could argue. Amen. But then once he had an experience, listen to this preacher. A man with an experience is never at the mercy of someone with an argument. Come on. And Paul had an experience with God. That's why I, church is important, camp's important, your prayer time's important, to have an experience with God. Once you've had an experience with God, folk can't talk you out of it. And he's had an experience. He got knocked down. He got blinded. Now he can see. Amen. He's understood miracle after miracle. He knows something's happened here. He knows about Stephen talking about Jesus at the right hand of the throne of God. He's heard the voice. So everything about this man has shifted. And they realize we've got to rescue him. We've got to do so. When, when the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket, little did they know that they were holding two-thirds of the unwritten 
New Testament there. As a matter of fact, my friend, inside that bucket was Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and probably the book of Hebrews is sitting inside that basket. But you don't know it yet. See, you don't know who you're holding a rope for. You don't always know who you're helping in life. You don't always know what's going to happen. But inside, this, inside that basket, there that was all that word that was written. Listen, it had not somebody held that rope. We would have never heard the words that a man is justified by faith. That he's saved by grace. That God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Amen. That we can stand and we can fall. That we have proper communion. We didn't even understand communion until this man began to explain to us, you need to wait on everybody else before you hit the cracker and the juice. Amen. Amen. The definition of real love. Did we even know what it was until this man told us that love envies not. Love it does not get jealous. Amen. Love keeps no record of wrong. Right there in that basket they had no idea but they hold on to the rope amen and they're lowering that man down they don't know what's inside there he he began to tell us in philippians that god always gives us a victory we become new creatures in christ he taught us to think eternal he said he actually said these light afflictions are just momentary i didn't realize that this man went through some afflictions this man was stoned to death this man came back alive again and came back and they got him in but they don't know that yet they don't know that yet. All they know is he was blind and now he sees and we got to get him out of here. So they're holding the rope for this guy. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. The fruit of the Spirit is. Learn that from the man in the bucket. Amen. We have redemption through his blood. He speaks of Jesus. I love the fact that Paul didn't point toward himself. He pointed toward Christ over and over. He said, put on the full armor of God. Where did I learn that? The book of Ephesians. He wrote that after he was dropped down in the bucket. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press. I can do all things through him, through Christ who strengthens me. For of the times and seasons of his return, I don't know when he's coming back. For the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. He told me about faith. Who's got faith? These guys that are holding that rope got faith. Amen. They're believing that that man in that bucket is going to change the world. Eh? But they don't know for sure. See, you don't know for sure. You don't know. That the people you hold the rope for, the people you love, the ones you teach in, in children's church, the ones that you help bless go to camp, you don't know what's. Paul needed assistance. There are times in all of our lives we need a Barnabas. We need somebody to assist us and help us. Paul needed support. He needed protection. Somebody look after me. You know, this, this faith life that we live, it ain't always walking out in front of a bullet. Sometimes we need somebody to stand up for us and tell us when to run. Sometimes I can't just stand right here. I got to go. Amen. Anyway, because they were trying to kill him. Let me just tell you that this reminds me that we have a responsibility to all those around us. On several occasions, I mentioned unsung heroes. I look at those in the booth back there, unsung. I look at Josiah got here this morning, opened the building, unsung. Amen. The, Pastor David, I know that you don't know it, but I know that you call people in the church and say, is there anything I can do for them? Unsung. When you understand how much that Pastor Joseph does for you, unsung. So, and then, then, then forget about us as leaders. What about all those behind us, Charlie, that's always doing stuff for us? Yeah. Amen. Taking care of things. Amen. That's the ones I look, the unsung heroes in life. You can't do what we do without people that want to hold the rope for you. Amen. They look after you. And let me add a commercial while I'm at it. Our, our connect groups. Amen. The things that we do. Uh, these, they're like life support groups to me. They, the teachers, the care leaders. Amen. Our church is designed that our small groups are a life support mechanism. I, I look at them and I realize so much that go on. What, what, you know, if you're in, in, in swap, you're holding a rope. And somebody's holding a rope for y'all. Amen. When, you, when you're in Forge or Ignite or, or all the groups that we got, whether it's in, in a pantry or somewhere like that, you're, you're blessed because somebody's holding a rope for you. Somebody's helping you out. And I pray to God, everybody in this house has somebody that's got a rope for you. And maybe two or three. If you're as heavy as I am, it's going to take eight or ten guys. Amen? That's going to do that. Parents, you, you have a paw at the end of your rope. You don't even realize to your kids sometimes what you're doing for them when you're holding a rope. Man, my kids, they have put me through so much stuff. 
I actually heard somebody say the other day they had five kids, and I went, wow, bless your heart, and then it hit me. So do I. <laughs> how many times I've held the rope for them, and now they're holding the rope for me. Now this thing can switch around. Teachers, you may have a pawl on the end of your rope. Sis, swap, ignite. You don't know. Forbes, quench. You, you don't know. You know, we don't know. These unsung heroes, somebody who carries a share of the responsibility of an ongoing ministry. When I, I look at HD&D, I've known them a long time, and they've been with me a long time. Pastor Richard, you've been with me a long time. You've held a rope. And oftentimes, it's funny how the guy in the basket gets all the credit. But if those guys didn't hold the rope, if they decided, why don't we just drop him? I, I wonder what it would sound like to hear the splat. I wonder if he can handle 30 feet down. Amen. Hey, hey, listen, although no one may know their names, it never gives their names. They don't sing their praise. They didn't even get to write their name on the rope. Right. Amen. So everybody would know who they were. It doesn't happen. They believe that Jesus is the answer, and they've committed their lives to the fruit of their labors. Amen. To totally benefit the kingdom of God by serving someone else. They're going to hold the rope. Through hurricanes, and though hurricanes may blow, they're going to hold the rope. When the floods came, they held the rope. Through controversy and adversity, amen, they hold the rope. When, when a loved one is suffering, they're going to hold the rope. When you need a ride... When you need food, when you need lodging, or you just need to get your stuff together, they're going to hold the rope for you. So holding the rope, I, I, this word is menial. That's the only word I can think of here, menial. It, menial task about eternity. Do you understand menial here? Well, when a, what a menial task is literally means, uh, the word means to work that requires little skill or training. That's what menial means. Little skill or training. Uh, it's not interesting. Confers low social status on somebody doing it. That's what's holding a rope. There's nothing to hold a rope. And yet, all the gospel has these little menial tasks that have to take place, amen, in life. Uh, <clears throat> Dirtiest Jobs is one of my favorite shows. It has to do with menial. Steve, you understand. Steve, I, if I remember right, you used to go around and pick up little rubber pieces for the end of the cap. Cap. You did that as a young man, didn't you? And now you've built uh, an industry almost out of it, from what I heard. Watch, but it's menial. Who just goes around and picks up rubber caps and throws them on the back of a trailer and goes and washes them and resells them? And then you do it so much that you've got to buy property, and you turn around and sell it for millions. And, and just want to throw that out there. Uh, but it all started with just a menial, just doing something, just something small, and something of that nature. When I, when I watch Dirty's Jobs, I've watched that guy, Mike Rowe. He, he, he goes out there. You, you'll see him uh, chasing snakes, catching alligators, chasing chickens. He'll go inside a, a, a bridge pylon. He'll work in a mushroom growing barn. He picks up manure. The list goes on and on. It looks just menial. But, but the truth of the matter is, that is life, and that's a part of the gospel. I remember some of the most menial jobs I had. I picked cotton as a kid, five years old. Anybody could pick cotton, amen, but I went and did that. Hoeing strawberries, picking beans, sweeping the RC Cola plant. Hey, you got a job in the plant, good. What do you want me to do? Take this broom and sweep the plant. How much brain power? Does that require? And yet, I'm out doing that, stacking drinks, sorting soda bottles. You remember the definition, work that requires little skills or training. It's not interesting to many of us. And yet, this is the gospel at times. It's the little things. The church has jobs that may seem menial. You know, and I'm going to say it again, may seem. May seem. But when you take care of the, the nursery, when you pick up chairs and put them down, amen, when you teach the kids, when you work the ropes course, when you're with the OCDs on the swing, you're cooking in the cafeteria, you're cleaning up after church dinner, when you're working back in the Pony Express, or what about cutting the grass, amen, and cleaning the pool, sorting clothes, food pantry, all the participation. What about the 30 to 60 minutes in quiet meditation and prayer on a Tuesday night? Seems menial, but huge results. Huge results. There is an encouraging thought that comes from this passage. When I think about Jesus in, in the book of John where he takes a fish and he snaps it and, and the head grows a, a tail and the tail grows a head. He takes bread, tortilla, and he heads it out among 5,000 men plus women and children. And what's he tell the disciples to do? Just give it out. Well, that's kind of beneath me. 
just give it out. Well, it ain't enough to feed them. Get started and see what happens. And I believe the miracle began to multiply itself as they began to snap the heads and, and the tails. It happens that way. So what makes these believers so special? First, faith. you got to have faith. Everybody say faith. To hold that rope. Man, you got to have faith. Firmly believe that God sees all. God, I know you are watching. And what I heard is that man in that basket is going to be an all right fella. So I'm going to believe by faith that this guy's got it together. So I'm holding the rope. Second, vision. you got to have vision. Because they have an ability to see the whole picture. Even though they play only a small part. Do you realize the vision? Yesterday, I'm walking the dog. The one that this leash normally holds on to. I'm mad at her, okay? She's a stray dog. Yeah, she was a stray. <laughs> now she's found a forever home. Um, adopted, yes, sir. And I get a message from David Huff. I call him up. Hey, buddy. Praise the Lord, Pastor Jerry. Hey, when am I supposed to be there this year? October 1 through 4th. We're going to have our 20th anniversary of our church and 30 years of me preaching. Oh, you've been doing it that long? I said, Brother David, no one has ever done it as long as you've done it. You're 78 years old and you're still rocking that guitar. Amen. So when I think of all the things and I, and I just start walking through this, I think that man had vision. Amen. Somebody held the rope for him. How about humility? Humility with courage. Because they are excited to work as a part of a team heading toward one common goal, they serve a little or no glory, fame, or promise of reward on earth. You know, let me just say this to be honest with you. If they catch him, they got me. I'll be guilty by association. And if they're trying to kill what's in that bucket, they're going to kill me. And in life, you've got to have enough humility to hang on and believe God that who you're serving, who you're looking after, who you're holding the rope for is so important. Paul, it, there's a cost to it. There's a cost to it. You know, in this text, they lowered him through the wall. But I'm telling you, had they caught that man, they'd have killed these men. If they'd have known who done it, they'd have been after him. Amen. I, I remember many years ago, and only a couple of you would remember this, that you're my age, but there was a, a, a performer by the name of Flip Wilson. Mm-hmm. Flip Wilson, had, he was popular in his comedy, and he had a character that was, was a preacher in one of his skits. And in, in the message, he said, what's happening now, church? Flip did a skit about this. He told about the preacher, and he'd shout out, if this church is going to serve God, it's going to have to go down on its knees and crawl. And the church yelled back, make it crawl, preacher, make it crawl. Then he got on it a little bit more. And once again, he would say to the church, if this church has learned to crawl, it's got to get up on its feet and learn how to walk. People in the audience began to yell, make it walk, preacher, make it walk. He said, to learn to walk, you got to get up and run. And the people yelled, make it run, preacher, make it run. Then he said, it's got to reach down deep into their pockets and learn to give. And the church yelled, make it crawl, preacher, make it crawl. <laughs> See, the bottom line is what we forget is that for this to happen, you still got to be a giver. You say, well, what am I doing? What, how am I helping hold the rope? When you give, you're helping hold the rope. You're supporting ministries in this house and around the world when you hold the rope. Now, Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, a religion that does nothing, saves nothing, gives nothing, that costs nothing, that suffers nothing, is worth nothing. I watch, uh, so I, I, I love history now, the older I get, and I've been watching some war movies, and, and, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, no, many of you may not know D who Dietrich is, but he was actually a young man who plotted the assassination of Adolf Hitler. He was a pacifist, which means he didn't want to fight or kill no one, but he realized that evil had gotten so bad that he plotted it. He made this statement, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. One of the books I had to read when I was in college was The Cost of Discipleship. And many times, again, American believers, we don't have a cost to us. We have a, a if it feels good, we'll do it, or maybe we'll go there. We're not as committed to holding the rope. But he makes this statement. And, and again, this man died in 1945, born in 1906, died in 1945. He was martyred by the Nazis because he refused. Uh, to give up his faith in God. Faithfulness is another one. You've got to be faithful. They can be dependent on, you know, I, the fact, here's what hit me when I'm reading this story. They saved him out of Damascus, <coughs> but
But the next group had to rescue him out of Jerusalem. It seemed like everywhere Paul was going, somebody was trying to kill him. And so faithfulness is important for somebody to stay with it, keep after it. They can be depended on to meet the needs as they arise. They're not letting go of the rope. Faithfulness produces God's favor. I say that all the time. When you're faithful to God, it will produce his favor. So let me start winding down here. Because of these unnamed heroes believed in and saved Paul, verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. I asked myself, Lord, how is it? How is it that churches can grow and grow and, and be peaceful? I'm going to tell you how. When you get the revelation that you are holding a rope, and you hold a rope for somebody, you hold a rope for the ministries of this house, you remind yourself that if, if you were, your name was never called, no one ever mentioned your name, but heaven knows your name. Because what you do here matters there. That the church enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Grew in numbers, amen. People lived in the fear of God. These are times we think having a different calling is less of a calling. It's not wrong. We are all full-time believers, unsung believers. We got a church full of them. We got a church full of them. He said, well, you know, and there are people watching right now that, w that worked and did things and held ropes, and now they need somebody to hold a rope for them. Amen. So it's important that we just reach in to our young people. Man, I would encourage you, get hold of a rope. Get hold of a rope. Hold the rope for somebody. Hold the rope for your parents. Hold the rope for your teachers. Amen. Hold the rope for somebody. It's simple. What can I do for you? Can I pray for you? Do you need anything from me? Amen. I just want to make life better. But I'm going to tell you, this church is full of We've got office workers, computer programmers, greeters, electricians, plumbers, carpenters, mechanics, maintenance, child care, cooks, sound, overhead, parking, servant leaders, those who spend their time vacuuming, scrubbing, washing, filing, phoning, ordering, mowing, bush hogging, amen, building, digging, welding, running errands, opening doors, fixing what's been broken around here. All the hundred things that's got to take place. I love church history. There are two, two guys I really, really admire a lot. Because I once out of Chicago, his name's Dwight Moody. D.L. Moody. <clears throat> D.L. Moody was, was a portly fella. There was another guy over in England named Charles Spurgeon. You ever heard of Spurgeon? Spurgeon, one of the great orators and preachers of his day. There, there was a meeting between the two. Dwight, uh, D.L. Moody wanted to meet Charles Spurgeon. So he went over to see him because he knew he was such a great preacher. He knocked on his door. Spurgeon answered, had a cigar in his mouth. D.L. Moody was shocked. He said, Pastor Spurgeon, you smoke. Spurgeon pulled his cigar out of his mouth and he said, My well, Pastor Moody, you're fat. <laughs> Let me take you back to a little history. The story of John Eglin in England. He had never preached a sermon in his life until one Sunday morning when it snowed and the pastor wasn't able to make it to church. John was called on to preach a sermon. Nobody else, the pastor couldn't get there. So he showed up. He's not a preacher. He admitted it. But he was faithful. And that man on that particular Sunday morning, he preached. God rewarded his faithfulness at the end of his hesitant sermon one young man got up, gave his heart to Christ. No one there could appreciate the significance of that, of what had happened place that morning. The young man who accepted Christ that snowy Sunday morning, the only guy in the church, was Charles Spurgeon. The man who has often been called the Prince of Preachers. God blessed his preaching, and when he was still less than 30 years old, he became the pastor of London's Metropolitan Tabernacle. His sermons were so powerful that although the building could hold 5,000 people, the crowds who came to hear him were so thick that they would line up outside trying to hear his message. That amazing life of faith all started on a cold Sunday morning with the faithfulness of a deacon who had never preached a sermon, given a message to a handful of people, but almost no one shows up, doesn't seem all that significant. But it demanded faithfulness, and God blessed John Eglin's faithfulness. I come to church 
And I've stood before full houses. I've been before thousands. But I never, ever demean the fact that just a few could change the world. Whether it be on a Tuesday night meeting or here in this house. I don't know who's listening, but I can tell you this. You've been holding the rope for this preacher for a long time. And there are a lot of things that I've said because you've held the rope. You'll remember it. I thank God for that. So I'll close with these words out of the book of Colossians. Chapter 3, verse 23. Colossians. Who wrote Colossians? Oh, I remember. <laughs> it was the man in the bucket. When he said, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ we're serving. Amen. That's all. Whatever you do, and work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. You ain't working for me. You ain't working for people around you. You're working for the Lord. I took this verse when I worked for RC Cola. I took this verse when I worked security. I took this bus work when I was a bus driver. Anywhere I've ever worked, I've took this word. Whatever I'm doing, I'm going to do it for the Lord. Amen. I'm going to work for Him. I'm going to hold the rope for my boss, my employer. I'm going to look after those around me. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance, we're going to get an inheritance. <laughs> that God has something planned for us simply because we held the rope. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'll say it again. This is one pastor that's proud to have been in the basket that you have held. Father, I pray with strength for the hands that hold the rope. I pray for minds to be sharp. I sense a reigniting in this house for people to grab hold of the rope and say, where, where do I fit in? And God, that you are re-energizing some that's been holding it for years for others. God, I thank you for those who held the rope for Paul the Apostle that we could have all the scriptures that this man of God wrote to remind us of his love for you and your love for us. I give you praise for this house in Jesus' name. And everyone say it. Amen. Come on, somebody. Give God a praise in here. So the question is, who holds the rope? What's the answer? What's the answer? We do. We hold the rope. Amen. You need to tie the offering envelope. I got some guys that are going to take the offering up here in just a second. And I'm going to tell you again, you may not recognize it, you may not realize it, but your tithe and your offering that you've got, I don't know where any of it is, there you go, makes a difference in this house. All the people that we help, and I know a lot of you are doing it online now. As a matter of fact, this 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 last month was the first time we, in a month's time, we there was more given online than was given in the house. So things are changing, whether I like it or not. But as we give today, I want you to think about this. We hold the rope for a ministry that's reaching into other countries. You're holding a rope for camps, for our kids, youth ministry, our, our children in the back. Amen. For SWAT. And there's some people that have been watching this service. They need to know you love them. So I would encourage you this week, send somebody a note with an I love you. Write them. Text. It's so simple now, isn't it? Man, when I... Just when I was in youth ministry, I would, I'd get all these kids to come in, and I would write every one of them. Tommy, I'd write every one of them a postcard. Now all I got to do is send out a group text. But I'd have to send out rich and handwritten notes to make sure them kids knew I loved them, and I appreciate them coming. I was with a man uh, last week. He had his Bible in there, and he opened his Bible. And I looked in his Bible, and there was a handwritten postcard from me 20-something years ago in his Bible. As we give today, we're believing God for more money. 
sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts to models, royalties received, favor. I'll take that. Amen. Pastor Dave, come on up here. Y'all give him a hand as he comes. 